Welcome to this super fun walkthrough on creating tasty cake toppings using Bifrost for Maya. Bifrost allows us to create a whole world of visual effects and with the implementation of NPM Gel, we can now create those incredibly delicious pack shots that we're used to seeing on TV commercials. Chocolate being gently laid over biscuit, cream being squirted over cake, ice cream being mixed together. It's all now possible within Bifrost without ever having to leave the Maya interface. This means we can seamlessly set up our animations and simulations and share those with different departments or artists, keeping a consistent, simple and non-destructive workflow throughout our pipeline. In today's walkthrough, we'll be diving into the Bifrost graph and focusing on NPM. NPM stands for Material Point Method. NPM is a powerful granular fluids and cloth simulation tool within the Bifrost graph editor with the ability to simulate with incredible realism effects such as snow, sand, cloth, fibers, liquids, and it's got many other applications. So let's get to it. Hi, so here's a muffin that I modeled earlier. Uh, it's a fairly like low res simple model. I've just sort of, you know, just pulled it about a bit. Um, and there's a wrapper that goes around it as well. Um, these are gonna be like our collision objects for the emitter, which is up here. So I've got an emitter that's kind of shaped like this, like a star shape. And all it does is animate around this animation curve, which I created. If you want to know how I created that spiral, simply just went to polygons, created a helix, and then I selected the edges down one side and converted them to a curve. And then I'm using that as my animation curve. So it goes from frame one to frame 180. And I've actually added the group to this animation curve rather than the emitters inside. That just meant I can control the emitters themselves independently. And I have done, I've animated this large piece to be rotated in X as it goes around. And then on one of the groups, we've got some scaling. I forget where it is, but when we get to the top, it just scales down. That's because I want a nice end to our kind of cream or chocolate, whatever it is, that drips onto it. Much like you see out of, you know, when someone pours ice cream out of uh, like a Mr. Whippy, or I'm not even sure what you would call it, but an ice cream tap. <laughs> I'm not sure what you call it. Anyway, that's that's why that is. And then I've got these like tiny little emitters around the edges of them, around the edges of this main emitter, which is going to give me like a little swirl that kind of runs on the inside. And they're just parented to this, so they just follow it around. But you'll see what I mean when we start getting into the simulation. And then there's this last guy at the end, which doesn't start animating until the first the first simulation is finished and this is just going to be pouring over some uh, extra chocolate sauce or any other kind of sort of sauce that you uh, would like to see so without further ado let's get the bifrost graph edit uh, graph started we're going to hit create graph here's our input and output and the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to drag in our colliders uh, i'll just call this Muffin, coal, that do. And then we're gonna pull in our first emitter, which is the main chocolate emitter. Uh, let's just move this input away. And I'm just gonna hit tab and start typing uh, gel, because that's all we're gonna be using, NPM gel. And we've got an NPM gel setup there, which we can bring into the scene by hitting uh, return. And I'm gonna right click on that and click explode. That's going to expose all of the necessary elements we need to get started with the simulation. We've got a ground plane influence. This is basically like a collider. You've probably seen it on other simulation bits of software within Maya. It's just kind of like a hidden collider that acts as a ground surface. We can see it if we hit D and kind of, you know, uh, you know there it is there. It's just, it's just under here. And we can make that bigger or smaller. It doesn't render, but we'll just turn that off for now. But we know that it's there as a collision. Um, you may want to undo this if you want to use your own collider. And then we've got a collider, which we're going to plug out muffin and the wrapper into that glider and then we've got our first emission which is the the main emitter i'm going to plug that into the first npm gel so firstly we've got our start frame and then we've got our end frame which i'm actually going to put in as 200 now i know that that um, animation curve says 180 but we've got that little bit at the end where it scales down and i want to see that how that affects the source so i'm just going to plug in the output here we're just going to have a little look at something now that we've done let me just plug that in there we go 
now that we've created the start and end frame and we're going to scroll down to distribution mode this is set volume by default but personally i'm using the surface on this i just don't need to be emitting from a volume i've got such a small little um, emitter here surface is working just fine and i think we may even get like a little bit of extra performance out of that the next section is particles per voxel. You don't want this too high. Too high means that your simulation isn't going to look right. It may look right in the amount of particles that you have in the scene. So if I put this up to like 500 and rewind, we can see we've got like lots of particles going on there. And that the default is just eight. We can see that we've barely got any particles going on there. So if I just move forward and they're really big, but this, this, you should take this lightly. There's like a sweet spot around between 60 and 70. We'll just stick in the 70 now. But if you have this too high, because it's particles per voxel, you're gonna end up with like collisions not looking right and that kind of thing. So we're just gonna leave that at 70. Scrolling down here, we've got some extra attributes, the actual gel properties themselves. Now mass is important, but for our initial lay down of, you know, our initial emission onto the collider, we don't really need to touch this, but we will with the chocolate that comes over the top in a little while. Viscosity, I'm gonna leave that off because I don't need viscosity on. Volume preservation, that just kind of makes sure that our surface stays in its original shape. It's kind of at its maximum at the moment, but I may just drop that down just to like 0.4. Vibration speed, that's kind of how the movement is like averaged out around surrounding particles. It is based on sound. Um, it starts to get a bit complicated for me to even think about, but basically, look at it this way. If vibration speed is higher, you're gonna get a more accurate simulation and less bounce on your gel and less wobble. If it's too low, you're gonna get a lot of wobble on your gel, but it depends what you're using. If you're going, if you're using like something that's supposed to replicate jelly or cream or whatever, we can lower this a bit because as it stands at 50, it is default. It's, you know, it's a good quality, but it's not gonna help us in terms of speed and simulation. So I'm gonna knock this back 50% down to 25. Yield stress is kind of the hero of the show here. And yield stress is what is gonna make the difference between something that's like very liquid like very watery and something that's very like toothpaste or thick chocolate we can go even higher than that but yield stress here i'm going to have this about three i'm not going to do anything with the initial direction and whatnot inherent velocity we're just going to keep an eye on that because our mirror is spinning around here over time if the gel starts flinging off in all directions because it's following the motion there's too much we can lower that but as it stands i'm just going to leave it so first things First, actually, let's just go down to the collider first. Look at the options in there because we've got bounciness on this collider by default, which we don't need because we don't need things to bounce. Friction, I'm gonna have that one. And then stickiness, again, another hero is, I'm gonna put that about three because we want our cream to kind of like hit that surface and stay on that surface. So let's just deselect that background. I'm just gonna rewind and play and see what we've got at the moment. Now, obviously we can't see much happening, you know, in terms of like the, the beautiful shapes we're gonna be looking for, but we can get a rough idea of how this is going to fall. NPM's quite forgiving in that you could run like a low res sim and get a fairly good idea of how everything's going to look. And it's very fast when you're, you know, looking at it and it's such a sort of a low resolution. So that all looks good. Now we've got this pointy tip up here is gonna be cool, uh, but we can't see much else at the moment, but that is fine. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add some color to it, because I'm gonna start adding the other emitters and I wanna be able to kind of differentiate between the two. So I'm gonna hit tab and just start typing particle, because I've got this node here that I put together called particle property reference. Now all that is, is we jump inside it it's made of three elements which are ready avail readily available in Bifrost, and that's an assigned material, a set geo property reference, and a standard surface material. And all I've done is wrap those things up, and I'll just quickly show you how and why I did that. So if I just start typing in assigned material, so let's just pretend that we are doing it the normal way. Um, I'll just start typing in reference, particle property reference, 
no that's not the one that's the new one um, reference uh, we want set geo property reference and then we want standard surface material and then we would connect all these guys together this would go to surface material and then I'd look at this one and try and remember what I have to put into material property and geo property so then I would have to go to my source npm gel and what we should do just quickly is add the source color property onto this npm gel by right clicking on additional properties we can get to this and in here we can see that it says our property is color and this section here is base color so I know that in here I have to type in base underscore color and I can't even remember if I have to use capitals or not and in here I'm just going to type in color so no I don't think I do need capitals um, or whether it even matters so base color probably does matter but anyway you see that I had to go through this kind of whole rigmarole of putting these three nodes together and you know it wasn't a lot but it's, it's enough to annoy me um, so if we just go in here and just check that I've got that correct yeah it is it's lowercase base on the scale, color score color and color and we've just done that here and here so all I've then done is right thought to myself okay I don't want to do that again and this is the joy of Bifrost I'm going to grab all these sections I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a compound and I'm going to call it whatever I want. You can call it whatever you want, as long as it's something that you remember does what we need to do. So I called mine particle property reference. You could call yours NPM color thingy if you want, if that's how you like to remember things. Um, and then you go inside and we'll find those three nodes. Um, and we'll just come over here and we'll be like, right, whatever we put on the input, is going to be exposed on that node further up okay so we're going to want base and we're going to want base color and subsurface etc 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 you don't have to put them all on there just ones that you think do you know what i'm going to use that and do you know what i'm not going to use that and then when you come outside you can see that you're starting to create a node that does things because we've got these inputs coming in and we can see that it's actually got attributes that we can use for color and whatnot Let's just go back in it again. The last thing you have to do is make sure that the output from the sign material goes to output. Um, and then we can actually use it. And we never have to figure out about typing the words base color and color and where they go and all of this kind of thing. Again, we can just, you know. And all you would do at that moment when you created that node is actually just to right click on it and go to publish. It would pick up your compound name from what you put in here already. And then you just click publish. And then the next time you type in whatever you called it, NPM color thingy, uh, it will come back and you never have to do it again. So that's all cool.